welcome to another episode of A Closer Look. My name is Katie Cole, and today I will be talking to Andrew Grimson from the Upper Valley Habitat for Humanity. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I would like to start off with just a summary of what Habitat for Humanity is. Sounds good. So uh, Habitat for Humanity has existed since the early 1970s in concept. It started in, in Georgia, uh, America's Georgia, with the Fullers, a um, couple who decided, hey, we need a model for getting people affordable homes. And so they tried a couple of experiments. They also tried it in Africa in a couple locations, f sort of firmed up the, the process. And then in 1976, actually formally formed Habitat for Humanity International. Since then, um, I'm trying to recall the numbers, but I think we've built probably a, a close to a million or over a million homes around the world. We've got 1,400 or so affiliates throughout the US. Um, and I think what everybody knows about Habitat is Jimmy Carter, who became involved, I think, in around 1984. He and Rosalind Carter became involved. Uh, even up through last year, was still going out on build sites, swinging a hammer. The best story I heard about him was uh, a contractor or a reporter, actually, who was sitting beside him trying to write a report and was watching him hammer nails. And he was amazed because in basically three strokes, he could drive a nail this long wow. at 85 years old. That's quite impressive. It is very impressive. I hope I'm like that at that age. <laughs> well, how did you get involved with Habitat? I got involved about 20 years ago. I was a volunteer uh, when I was living in Michigan, um, just showed up on a build site um, no real skills, and they were very patient, and I learned how to hammer, I learned how to use a saw, and just had a great time, because it was great to see the family that we were working with. The family was there alongside us, and it was great to see them sort of building their home, not just their house, but building their home. And it was very rewarding for, for us as volunteers to be part of that. Well, can you talk a little bit about the application process and the requirements a family needs to have in order to qualify for a house? Yeah, sounds good. So I'll, I'll, uh, a couple of things, you know, we try and keep it fairly simple, but um, basically what we're looking for is people whose present uh, housing condition is not adequate. So it could be you know, three kids sharing a bedroom. It could be the state of the of a rental or the house. Uh, it could be you know a lot of repairs required, uh, or it just rent is a big part of their income. So it may be 50% of their income is going towards rent. Um, the other thing is you know they can't if they're not able to afford um, uh, or able to obtain. Um, traditional bank financing. They may not qualify because of uh, ratios or because of credit history. We're able to work with them more directly with that. So what we look at is you know, families that are between 30 and 80 percent of median county income. And for, for the families around here, ranges from about 35,000 a year to 60,000 a year family income. And there's depends on family size and some other circumstances. The other aspects we look at is they need to be able to zero, afford our mortgage, and we, we work as hard as we can to keep that affordable. We have to still you know, recoup our costs for building the house but, or, or renovating the house, but we look at rec uh, making it affordable for them. So they have to be able to do that. They also need to provide 500 hours of sweat equity. So they'll work alongside building the house. We have some folks who can't do that, so they become the lunch crew or they work in our office or some of their family and friends can help out uh, working with us as well and for the sweat equity. And finally, they have to be a uh, resident of the Upper Valley for at least a year. Uh, we, we, we do require that as a, you know, they're, you're here for the long term. Uh, and that's about it. It's, uh, you know, those are the aspects we look at. That's amazing. Do you find that people are excited to help build their own houses? Do they enjoy it? I think I'll say excited and scared. Uh, <laughs> we have people who, who come in and like, it's a little overwhelming at first, especially when 20 people show up on a site to help frame your house or put up drywall. Uh, but once they get into it, they, they really enjoy it. And, and talking to people years later, they come back and say, you know, that was a great memory. We had so much fun. We, we built community around this. So how many houses do you typically build a year? We, historically, we've been building about one a year. Um, our plan is to really actually grow that significantly over the next few years so we can get up to four or five years are, is our target. Wow. We see the need in the Upper Valley, and we, we really want to start addressing that. Definitely. I know that one of the problems in the Upper Valley specifically is that houses are older. They've been built in the 1800s. They don't have a lot of insulation. They're, you know, they're very expensive to heat and cool. I'm sure that's a problem that you see pretty frequently around here. We do. We do. I I mean, everybody has a romantic idea of that 1780 farmhouse that is so wonderful. Uh, they are, they are, 
a lot of work required to get them back up to code. We, we build any new houses we build, we build to efficiency Vermont standards. We go for the high performance house. So ultimately what that means is not only are we doing something great environmentally, but we're also reducing the cost of home ownership. And so what we're seeing is that instead of spending, you know, eight or nine hundred or a thousand or two thousand dollars a year on oil to heat the place plus four or five cords of wood, half a tank of propane for the year. Wow. And so it makes a big difference for the over the long term for the homeowners. And and remember our homeowners we we want them to be there for the rest of their lives. This is their forever home. Right. Uh, and I just mentioned as well, is one of the best parts of my job is when we go to a mortgage burning. When we go and see the family that paid off this house in twenty years or twenty five years and you hear their stories about, oh gosh, you know, we were really in tough times before we got this house. We rebuilt our credit, we built the house, we raised our kids here, and now this is ours, you know, for the rest of our lives, and we we own it fully and open and completely. That's amazing. It is. What does the typical habitat for a community family look like? Is it a single person? Do they have children, pets? What's the normal? All of the above. Um, so we don't. And this is a question we actually get quite a bit is, well, what if it's a same-sex couple or what if it's a you know, single parent? We accept anybody. And, and that's not just because of the laws, but just also because of our mission is that we don't, you know, we, we take anybody in. And we have some people who are single. We have uh, families, I think, of up to eight people. We have one family that has three kids plus some grandkids, wow. uh, which makes it a little bit tight at times. But they, you know, they, we, we take them all. Of and um, in fact, one of the one of the families we're working with right now is, is a single lady, um, had a stroke at a young age, is been amazingly resilient, has has you know worked all her life in spite of having some paralysis. We're now looking to figure out, okay, where are we, we need to build for her, but we need to build a house that's going to be suited to her, not just now, but down the road. Right, and wheelchair accessible, I'd assume. Wheelchair yeah. accessible, uh, single level, ramp going in. You know, she can do stairs right now, but in the future might not be able to. Right, so how do you plan for that accordingly? Uh, <laughs> that's always a fun <laughs> challenge for my job. We, what we do is, is you know, we're, a couple things we do is we, we get the families in first and we work with them to make sure that they're going to meet all the financial requirements, that they qualify in our other aspects. Once we have the families, then we say, okay, do we have land available, which we have a few lots, do we have an existing house that, that maybe we can work with, or is there a house out there that somebody may want to sell or donate to Habitat? Then we sort of match, okay, family to the right house and to the right location. One of the things we see in the Upper Valley is long commute distances, uh, especially for people working in Lebanon, Hanover, Norwich. Um, I, I've seen people commuting from St. Johnsbury, from Springfield, from uh, down even close to Manchester, New Hampshire. They're putting 100, 150 miles a day commuting. We're trying to look at and say, okay, where are the jobs? Where's this family work? What are their needs? And, and come up with an optimal solution as to where we can locate them and bet, get the best house room and keep it affordable. Right. So there's a lot of components that go into finding the right fit for a Ab family. Absolutely. And that's what makes this job fun. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I guess, is the actual application process? Let's say I wanted to, I was, you know, financially unstable and I needed assistance. Yeah, that's good. Oh, that's actually, that's great. Because um, what we do is we have, basically, we have a process, with, I'll call it with three gates. Um, people will come in and apply. Uh, it's about an eight-page application. I'm sorry, but we have to do that. Um, <laughs> but we sit down with our family, applicant families right away and say, let's work together on the application. Because sometimes giving somebody this long application can be very scary. Right. So we'll sit with them, work through it. We then do get some pay stubs, look at what, okay, initial sort of first uh, picture on the financials. Are you going to be within our income ranges? Are you going to roughly be able to afford it? If that looks good, we go to our family committee, they review it and say, yeah, this makes sense. And by the way, our family committee is made up of volunteers. Uh, they're people from the community, from various backgrounds. We have social service folks, we have bankers, we have just people who generally want to be there and do the right thing. And they're very lenient as far as getting families in. Because our goal is to get families into homes. We're not there to put up barriers. Right. Um, once we get through that, then we, uh, with, the, with approvals, we run a credit check and do a background check. Uh, if you know, and, and not everybody's credit report is perfect. Uh, a lot of us have little blemishes. Uh, one of the nice things between us that compares us to the banks is we're not as tied as far as, as having to meet requirements on FICO scores or debts. We have some more leniency around that, and we can we can we can work with that. 
Um, we actually hold the mortgages uh, for the houses. So we put up the financing, and then we, um, we got repaid back on that mortgage by the family at a 0% interest. Um, and I'll put in a plug here as well, is that Ledger Bank services all our mortgages pro bono, uh, and they've done that for years, and that's one of the great supports that we have from the community. Right. Our last stage, and I know this is long, uh, is that uh, once they pass the credit checks, then we go through, have a family, have an interview with the family, so members of our family can meet with them, meet the family, make sure this is the right fit for everybody. And from there, then it, we put together a proposal with budget, goes to our board of directors, they approve it. That process is probably about three months. Um, and it used to be over a year. We've actually we really streamlined this to make it much faster because making somebody wait a year just to get an answer in a house is just too long. Right. One of the things I'll add as well is that you know in this process, if we find that, oh, there's an issue with your income's not quite right or you've got too much consumer debt, we'll defer. We won't reject, we'll defer and right. say, hey, come back and talk to us in a month, a couple of months, let's see how you're doing on the debt. We can also uh, tap into financial coaches, um, I'll do my second plug for the day is we do a lot of work with Twin Pines. We partner with them on a number of projects, but they have a financial coach available and, and we work with them. Uh, it's great being able to work with other nonprofits in the community um, because we don't all, we all sort of have our own areas, mm -hmm. but then we can overlap and get people to the right place. And we've had instances where, you know, somebody comes in, they're not ready for home ownership, but they're good rental candidates. So we'll send them over to another agency. That's pretty amazing, and I think that's probably indicative of the Upper Valley being a very close-knit, small community. You know, everyone <laughs> knows everyone. You can't go to the grocery store without seeing your neighbor. <laughs> very true, and it, it's funny because I do go to the grocery store, and I'll, I'll see people, and I even was walking down the street the other day carrying one of our signs, and uh, somebody just on the street said, hey, Habitat, great job. You guys do great work. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> oh, that bit of validation probably felt so good. It did, it did, yeah. 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 So from start to finish, how long does the application process usually take? Probably about three months is 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 what we're seeing right now. Okay. It depends if we have to do some deferments or not, but um, you know that's three months to get approved. Then we, if we have funding available, then and it's depending what time of year, then we can immediately start construction. You know, if we get approval at uh, in December, well, we're not going to start construction until April or May. Right. You know, building in the winter is not. Our volunteers tend not to really like doing that. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for someone that is interested in volunteering, what would you say? How would you say to get involved? Um, so a couple of ways you can do is, you know, uh, we have a website, and we'll, uh, we'll post that on later. Um, we have a Facebook page, uh, which we just set up this past year. Um, you can call our office. Uh, you can stop by our office. Um, I know I have our PO box there, but we'll put our, our address up. We're actually the, up on the third floor of the Gates Briggs building. Um, you stop by our office. We're in there Mondays and Thursdays. Just come and talk to us. Find a, you know we'll tell you what we're doing. As far as volunteers, we need anybody who wants to jump in. You don't have to have skills. Um, we'll train you. Uh, we have you know we sort of have some seasoned retired contractors to work with us who are very patient. Um, sometimes you're just you know you're working a shovel and cleaning up a, a work site. You're pushing a broom. Uh, you know as you get better at it, we'll put you up a framing a roof. Um, you know, we, we, it depends what you want to do. <clears throat> we also have a number of people who love bringing our lunches, which makes you very popular with the crew. When you show up with a, just a, you know, a bucket full of sandwiches and some drinks, it's, you, know, you get some great hugs as a, as a lunch provider. Um, but you know, some of the other things we're looking at is we have committees. We have fundraising committee. We have family committee. We have our building committee. We have um, a couple others that we, we, you know, we love to have people work on or uh, volunteer for. Our board of directors, uh, we're always looking for people. We have uh, three-year terms or six-year terms, depending on how long people want to stay on. But we want to keep the community involved. You know, what drives this is the community. Uh, my own background is I, I started as a board member four years ago. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, just sort of volunteered. It's like, oh, you know, I, maybe I'll join the board. I've been wanting to do something, got involved in the board. Uh, then became vice president. Then last year, through some changes, I thought I was going to retire. That lasted two hours. <laughs> and so uh, we were looking for new executive director. So I volunteered. I took it on pro bono for the rest of last year and then started this year. I'm now uh, in a paid position as doing this um, and having a blast. Wow. So how many hours a week do you usually put in? 
Well, <laughs> okay, this is on camera, so I'll say probably about 30 to 40, but it's more likely probably about 50 or 60 hours a week. Definitely. It varies. Yeah, yeah. it varies. Um, one of the things about this job is you're always thinking and, and sleeping and eating on it. Um, but I have to tell you, after you know, 35 years in industry and, and higher education, this is the most fun I'm having in my life. This is where you're doing something meaningful. This is where you're seeing the impact of what you do. When you go in, you know, and you, as you say, in the grocery store, you come across, oh, there's the family that lives at this place, or there's the family that works there, or oh, that's our volunteer that worked here. Uh, that's very rewarding, and you don't get that in many jobs. So It's true. It's true, yeah. What's one of the most common questions you get asked about Habitat? Um, well, people want to know when Jimmy Carter's coming, uh, <laughs> you know, we, which we'd love to have him here. Um, I think probably the biggest question is, you know, what do you do? And I, it was surprises me because I always thought everybody knew Habitat, but it's, I think the question is, well, what do you do? Do you give away free houses? Well, no, this is not, this is not a TV show. We don't give away free houses. Um, we, I think it's just trying to explain sort of what we do in a nutshell. That's probably the most common question we get. I definitely think there is a misconception that, you know, your organization just kind of gives away free houses to people and they don't, you know, the general public doesn't really understand the process and the requirements that really go into acquiring a house. Right. And, and exactly. And I think that maybe that's why the model was developed, I think, a few years ago is, is you know, we're a hand up, not a handout. We're not giving away houses, but we're giving you the tools and we're giving you the assistance to build your home. Right. Uh, it's kind of like the, the adage of, you know, we're not giving you fish. We're teaching you how to fish. Right, exactly. And that's why equity, I'm sure, probably makes donors a little bit more uh, solid in their decision to <laughs> donate their money. We hope so, yeah. Because <laughs> I think, and, and you know, for donors, I mean, all the money that comes in, you know, we have some overhead costs to keep us operating, but all of our money we basically put into building houses and into our program. Um, you know, one of the things I'm always keeping a close eye on is, okay, where's, how's our money being spent? Because I'm trying to keep our costs down as low as possible, because every dollar we don't spend on some administrative or overhead thing, that's a dollar that goes into the house. Right. And so we're always looking at that. For that. Okay. <laughs> So what upcoming projects do you have for the Upper Valley Habitat for Humanity? We've got actually quite a bit on our plate right now. We, we had a couple of years where we didn't do a lot in terms of new construction. We were focused more on home repairs and on, on a neighborhood revitalization, which I'll talk to a little bit more in a second. Um, right now we've got, uh, we're planning potentially a house in Sharon, single family home. Um, it's a couple that both work in Bethel. And we, we thought, oh, we could build one, one of our existing lots, Lebanon. But as I talked about earlier, get people closer to their jobs. And so one of the things we're in the final stages of looking at is building this single family home in Sharon. That's one that we would kick off this spring. Uh, the second one we're working on, and this is actually in, in uh, cooperation with Twin Pines, is uh, in Woodstock uh, Safford Commons development. They built a number of rental units. And there's also a number of units that are uh, designated to be homeowner. Um, they do a great job building 15, 20 units at a time. We do a great job of building one or two at a time. So right. we have a duplex planned to be built in Woodstock. Uh, again, probably this spring, might be the summer before we get started on it. We're still trying to get the families in for that one. Um, I think I'll mention as well is that you know uh, the, this is these are some that th some of the things that Upper Valley Habitat is doing. We also have a group in the Northeast Kingdom in St. Johnsbury, uh, Upper Valley Habitat in the Northeast Kingdom, which is a really long name. Um, they have kind of a unique situation. They do basically what we call critical home repairs or brush with kindness projects. So they're working a lot with. Uh, their demographic who already have homes. They don't need to build a lot of new homes up there, but their older homes are their people who now need some help. And so they're looking at aging in place projects, so ramps, grab bars. They're looking at critical home repairs like, oh gosh, we need a roof replaced, but we don't have the money to do it. Um, they are doing those kinds of projects. They are unique as well as that they cover 2,000 square miles. They cover three wow. of three northern counties in Vermont, and uh, they have 2,000 square miles of territory to cover. Um, they're amazing. They have uh, a group of people they call the A-Team, which is a group of retired contractors. They all go out with the volunteers, work on their projects. They do these smaller projects, so they don't do as much in terms of new home construction. For us, what we're looking at as well is um, we've realized as well as that getting on, you know, buildable land is getting tougher in the Upper Valley. We have mountains around here. They're not easy to build on. <laughs> uh, what we're looking at, though, is, and this is something for folks to think about, is 
We'd love to find some of the homes that were built in the 1950s and 60s. They're the nice, well-built ranches. They're perfect for a small family. They're already in an established neighborhood. There's already neighbors. There's already community. And what we've done with those in a couple of cases, and we want to do more of this, is we go in, we buy the house, or if the house is donated or, or given it to us at reduced cost, we can then go in and gut the house down to the framing, put in new windows and doors, update the electrical and plumbing and mechanical systems, super insulate it, and then we have a highly energy efficient home in an established area. It already feels like a home, not just a house. And I'm sure that's quite more cost efficient than building a whole new home. It tends to be, yes, yeah, especially if we're building where we have to put in well and septic. Right. And you know, this way you're also on typically on town water and sewer. The last one I'll mention is, this is going on for about three years now, is we've been working on a program in Claremont, New Hampshire, uh, called Neighborhood Revitalization. And what we've done there is we're, we t identified an inner city neighborhood, very tough times, uh, a lot of rentals, a lot of homes that were just really starting to show the wear and tear. And what we're doing now is we're working with families in this neighborhood who are owners, and doing small projects. Could be just doing some painting, repairing a porch, replacing some windows. We basically, our studies have shown that if we can do two to three homes of that, of that type of project per year for four or five years, we reach a tipping point in that neighborhood. And then all of a sudden other people say, oh, you know, my neighbor did this work here and they did this work. Yeah, it's time for us to do some work here. Or, gee, this neighborhood's, you know, the, the houses are, are lower cost, but the neighborhood's coming up. And we've seen this work in other cities. We know it can work here. We have, uh, we're part of a group called Healthy Vibrant Claremont. Um, we have the city manager, the mayor, the chief executive for um, Sullivan County, superintendent of schools are all in this together with us. And we're starting to see after two years of work, we're now getting more families in. We're starting to see some, some progress on this. It takes a while. But this is, this is also what we're looking at. If we want to then take this same idea and look at other towns and say, are there neighborhoods where we could go in and start doing some of these smaller projects? That's, that's sort of what we've got going on. Yeah, I would assume White River Junction is probably a good example of that. You know, White River had a bit of a reputation for the past <laughs> couple of years, but yeah. with some major building and, you know, a revitalization of the town, Absolutely. it's becoming quite popular. You know, the restaurants and, you know, young people are going there to hang out. You know, it's pretty pretty big. As, as evidenced by trying to get parking in downtown White River Junction. Honestly. Our office is in the, in the uh, Gates, big, uh, Gates Briggs building. I mean, there are days where we have to circle the block four or five times before we get a spot. Um, yeah, I agree. I think that there's a lot going on, and, and we want to be doing more of this. I'm actually reaching out to the town managers to meet with them and talk about what can we do in terms of neighborhood revitalization, what can we do in terms of identifying, hey, there's homes coming up maybe on tax sale. We can work with those homes, get families in. Is a lot of different paths to making this work. But the nice thing is, I think you mentioned earlier, is, uh, earlier is small town, tight community, We've got that support behind us, and we want to keep that support going. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's been a pleasure talking to you Thank today. Thank you very much, Kitty.